the sitting is resumed and it's oral questions to the Minister of Health, Social Services and Public Safety. Fergal McKinney. Mr McKinney. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Question number one. Ward 5 North of the Belfast City Hospital provides a GP direct assessment service. There are also 19 co-located medical beds. The Belfast Health and Social Care Trust has advised that the GP direct assessment function and capacity will remain in the Belfast City Hospital, but will be relocated to Ward 6 North. The direct assessment service within the Trust is also being enhanced with the introduction of direct GP admission and assessment on the Royal Victoria Hospital site. The co-located medical beds in the City Hospital will transfer to the Royal Victoria Hospital, and the changes are expected to take place in early December. Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister? Would, would he agree that the accessibility of community care beds is an integral part of health provision in Northern Ireland and should be maintained? I absolutely agree that that's the case, and uh, I think that uh, the decision that we took uh, to ensure that there was uh, a differentiation between uh, a hospital which is carrying out emergency care and a hospital which is carrying out elective care uh, enabled us to uh, point the hospitals in two very clear directions, uh, was to ensure that we will be able to best meet community needs and to ensure that we can at the same time uh, ensure that elective care is carried out with less disturbance and interruption um, from the emergency sector of the hospital. Gordon Dunn. Mr. Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answers today. Can the Minister advise of what are the plans within the Belfast Trust for bowel surgery? Well, uh, the service uh, is a proposal to move the service to the Belfast City Hospital site, and uh, one of the recommendations of a public consultation on the reorganisation of the delivery of acute services in Belfast is the relocation of elective surgery. Uh, delivered the Royal, Vic Royal Hospitals to the Belfast City Hospital and to Matter to enable all of the emergency surgery to be based at the Royal Hospitals. Well, one of the proposed models for general surgery that was accepted was at specialist units for colorectal surgery and esophagogastric to move to the Belfast City Hospital, allowing separation of the elective and emergency flows, ensuring that both the uh, emergency and elective uh, patients receive the level of care appropriate to their clinical needs and enable the development of sustainable complaint uh, junior doctors and consultant voters. Jonathan Craig. Mr. Craig. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number two. The vision for the community resuscitation strategy is to increase the survival for those who suffer an out of hospital cardiac arrest to the highest level that can be achieved across Northern Ireland. To help achieve this seven objectives have been identified within the strategy, which was published for consultation on the 20th of November, and I'd encourage everyone to contribute any ideas they feel could strengthen the strategy in any way. Mr. Craig. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank the Minister for that. Would the Minister uh, consider that the current provision for CPR training is adequate, or does that need improving? Well, the Department recognises the importance of having people trained in CPR skills and included a standard nine in the service framework for cardiovascular health and well-being, which was published in, in 2009. But there's already a lot of resuscitation training taking place each year in Northern Ireland, organised by various organisations. And as resources are finite, the challenge is to achieve as much as possible with the resources that are available. And as a pilot undertaken by my department demonstrated Cascade training is feasible and is a viable way of increasing the pool of people who can provide CPR in an emergency. Even a modest increase in the survival rate could mean up to 100 people would be alive across Northern Ireland who would otherwise not have survived their cardiac arrest. So we believe it is very important um, that we have further training for people uh, in cardiac resuscitation and believe that it can make a massive difference in terms of the number of people who survive out of hospital heart attacks. Carmi Kevitt. Um, can I ask the Minister, does he uh, accept, given the fact that the correlation between response times and cardiac arrest survival, a strong communication infrastructure is necessary uh, in order to tackle out, uh, out of hospital cardiac uh, arrest fatalities? Thank you. Well, communication, of course, is vitally important. Uh, 
In the first instance, the more people that we can have trained in cardiac resuscitation, the quicker the response. For every minute um, that, that a person uh, has a cardiac arrest without having a, an, a, any uh, defibrillation and, and any life-saving work done on them, 10 per cent uh, risk is, is, is raised. Um, so that is a, a big issue. We also need to know where the defibrillators are. Uh, because there are around 1,000 defibrillators across Northern Ireland. No benefit to anybody if they're in a box somewhere that nobody knows about. So it needs to be very clear if they're in clubs, if they're in railway stations, bus stations, uh, places where there's a lot of movement of the public, um, that uh, people know that where they're readily accessible. And we need as many people in the community that are actually trained and capable of doing this. So communication, uh, response, reaction, all of that is critically important so that the public can hold the line until uh, the first responders get there in, in the form of uh, our ambulance service. Mr McCarthy. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, can the Minister um, assure us that uh, all the efforts and the strategy will reach those, particularly in sporting organisations, where it's all too uh, frequent the young people just suddenly collapse in the middle of the field? But if they had this uh, within their uh, club, it could possibly be prevented. Well, a regional business case application for sustainable delivery of an ELS through schools, workplaces and communities in Northern Ireland has been developed by the Northern Trust on behalf of all of the Trusts. And in December 2011, this was submitted to the HSCB. And that application requested recurrent funding for CDR posts across each of the five Trusts, with each of the CDROs being responsible for the delivery of ELS training in schools, communities and across the health service to frontline staff. So I understand these posts have been funded until March 2014 and that will uh, help enable us to, to get information out to the schools. I think that we can work very closely as well with the sporting clubs um, who have a massive reach uh, into the community and we need to look at other organisations as well, uh, you know, boys brigade, girls brigade, scouts and all of those areas uh, where we can have the skills developed within the community that can make that fundamental difference. Uh, whenever someone has a heart attack. Question number three, Mr. Wells is not in his place. Maeve McLaughlin. Well, I've got question number four. I am continuing my discussions with the Republic of Ireland's Minister for Health, Dr. James Reilly, TD, to explore whether it would be possible to establish a two centre paediatric congenital cardiac services model within the island of Ireland to be located in Belfast and Dublin. My overriding concern is the safety of those very vulnerable children and obtaining the best possible treatment and care for them. I am yet aiming to make my final decisions and future arrangements for this service as soon as possible. And I thank the Minister for that. Um, can I ask the Minister, just given the, the real public concern uh, around the timeline on this issue, um, can I confirm that there will be a decision that will involve surgery being maintained in Belfast? And can I confirm the timeline on that decision? I'd hope to be in a, in a position to do it this week uh, and to make my announcement, but discussions are still ongoing. Uh, I think that people shouldn't underestimate how difficult this process has been, uh, the challenges that, that, that have been involved in it. And uh, we need everybody uh, singing off the same hymn sheet, working very hard on achieving that hopefully quite close to getting that. And uh, as soon as I can, I, I will bring the information um, to the House and to the public. Uh, and I trust that that will be very, very soon. Uh, as I indicated, I'd hope to do it this week. Uh, but I don't believe that it should be necessarily much longer. Uh, and we really need to be getting that message out um, to the people who have real and genuine concerns and obviously real needs. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'm sure the Minister is aware that this is a press item today in the media, but would the Minister consider that a two-centred model um, would serve as a positive example of good cooperation between Belfast and Dublin, and maybe uh, possible a way forward for uh, cardiac services in uh, Northern Ireland? Well, clearly, Northern Ireland, it isn't feasible to have a standalone service, and, and people. Um, I think most people do recognise that, uh, that we don't have the sorts of numbers that go through the Belfast Children's Hospital, the Royal, Royal Belfast Hospital for Sick Children. 
We don't have the numbers there. So we need to be working with others in terms of delivery of that service. Uh, so we do, look, do we look to England? Do we look to Scotland? Um, do we look to the Republic of Ireland? And uh, perhaps it's a mix. Uh, some of the most complex cases um, leave the island of Ireland, wherever they happen to be, both the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland, to travel to England because of the complexity of the operations. Uh, others uh, would be best suited for Dublin, but I believe that there is opportunities um, for us to retain services in Belfast, and that's very clearly what we have been arguing for and seeking to obtain. But it needs to be done in a way which is both safe and sustainable, and that has been the challenge that is to us. Uh, to ensure that the services are that are provided are safe and sustainable. I should say that in congenital cardiac care, there has been massive improvement in the delivery of that service in terms of the surgery, and surgery is carried out in a very safe way. And we need to ensure that whatever we offer in Northern Ireland meets that same standard of safety as it does anywhere else, and we can't fall short of that. And that is one of the key elements that we are working to to ensure that safety exists. Pat Ramsey. Mr. Ramsey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the Minister for her, his response. And clearly, it is a subject matter that is causing deep worry, anxiety and distress to parents. Could the Minister, and I do sense his frustration today in the process that he is not enabled to make a formal decision in terms of that, could the Minister outline to the House where he sees the, the obstacles or the concerns that is not able him to make a decision? Well, I need cooperation from, from everyone involved, uh, Mr. Speaker. And clearly, uh, clearly I, I need the cooperation of surgeons in Dublin, if they are to take up that role, or indeed surgeons from another centre if, if the Dublin surgeons aren't prepared to help us. And I, I don't underestimate the ask that we are making of the surgeons in Dublin. So I'm asking a lot of them. And therefore, it may not be unreasonable for them uh, not just to immediately jump up and say, well, I want to facilitate Minister Putin with his request. So we need to recognise that, that uh, if they do assist us in all of this, that is a very uh, major thing that they're ta taking on, a major challenge, and uh, they need our respect uh, if, if they do that. Uh, so we'll continue to, to, to have those negotiations. Uh, and they're at a very tentative stage, uh, and I trust that we can work our way right through them and uh, be able to report to the Assembly very, very soon. Roy Banks. Mr. Banks. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Would the Minister accept that as of the 9th of December, when the Professor Woods uh, completes his work in Belfast and there would not be a paediatric cardiac surgeon for, for in, in Belfast, that, it, uh, that there is a real danger of many uh, of the services for uh, specialist services for children starting to unravel and that we have a very short critical window remaining? Well, I'm very well aware of the, the short and critical window. The, the, this service was under pressure uh, before Professor Woods announced his intention to, to move on to something else. Uh, there has been advertisements put out for a replacement for Professor Woods. There has been interest um, in that position, which we're very grateful uh, about. And, uh, we will make every effort to fill uh, his position. It will be uh, a big ask to get someone of the standing of Professor Woods. Let's be realistic about that. Uh, and it may involve someone who requires further training, which makes it all the more essential that we have a liaison with another centre which has all of those skills and expertise that will allow us to develop um, our own staff further in the Royal Victoria uh, in the Royal Belfast Hospital for Sick Children. Pam Brown. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number five, please. Health and Social Care and the Northern Ireland Chest, Heart and Stroke Association are working in partnership to develop a new Northern Ireland wide service to actively, actively identify people with a particular genetic disorder called familial hypercholesterolemia, F H, which causes very high blood cholesterol. This will build on the existing service in the Belfast HSC Trust and should result in an additional 1,000 people with F8 being diagnosed and treated over the first four years of the pro programme. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his, his answer. Um, can I ask the Minister how common the, um, 
countrywide FH services um, like this are on, in an international context? Well, early identification and treatment of FHs will prevent cardiovascular deaths, deaths in this population. And, uh, Additional cases are generally found by systematically identifying, investigating and testing uh, family members of all known cases uh, of FH. And the service uh, that uh, we're funding through a partnership between Health and Social Care and Northern Ireland Chest, Heart and Stroke Association are supporting the development of a bespoke IT system. And it will allow the appointment of specialist FH nurses and additional genetic testing. So Northern Ireland at that point will be one of only a, a few countries to have a countrywide F8 service, uh, including Wales and the Netherlands. And a manual baseline audit has been completed to identify the current Northern Ireland F8 population and a business case for a regional F8 register and specialist nurses to provide cascaded testing for F8 has been approved. A current funding of £107,000 per annum has been identified to fund, fund the development. Uh, of F8 uh, cascade testing services, and uh, this was only uh, possible uh, because of the, the lobbying and the work that Chest Heart and Stroke Association have carried out on this particular issue. Dominic Bradley, Mr. Bradley. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank the minister for his answer. Could I, could I ask the minister um, what efforts are being made to? trace, track and treat uh, high levels of cholesterol within families which are uh, genetically uh, prone to the condition. Thank you. Well, that's essentially what the, the F8 screening is about. And, uh, the service framework for cardiovascular health and well-being has recently been reviewed and a revised version will be published shortly. It sets out the standards in relation to prevention, assessment, diagnosis, treatment, care, rehabilitation and palliative care of individuals, communities who currently have or are at greater risk of developing cardiovascular disease. I, that framework was launched in 2009 and led to a number of improvements in the quality of care that people of Northern Ireland receive. And the revised framework will build on the earlier success, setting new priorities for cardiovascular health in Northern Ireland and continuing to improve the health and well-being of the population of Northern Ireland. And the revised framework contains a specific standard relating to identification and treatment of all people with genetically linked high cholesterol, and the identification of other family members through regional register remains a priority. Mr. Gallagher. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I appreciate what the, the, the minister has already said, but could the minister advise what preventive action he has taken with preschool children? and their parents to reduce the likelihood of high-level cholesterol later in life? Well, the public health agency, of course, have, have a key role in uh, advising on, on how people can manage their cholesterol. Um, some people will naturally have higher cholesterol than others, and uh, therefore some people can get away with um, eating foods that perhaps others will cause them major problems. Um, so obviously we encourage people in terms of their diet to um, have uh, less fats, less sugars, um, perhaps uh, not as much carbohydrates as, as, as some people might, might, might take, uh, and consequently um, reduce uh, the levels of cholesterol. And of course, uh, good advice for, for young people to take would be a good bowl of porridge every morning, um, and that helps uh, deal with cholesterol. It's one of the best means of dealing with cholesterol, and funny, the simple things in life are very often uh, the best solutions. Ian McRae. Mr. McRae. Question number six. Death rates from coronary artery disease have been falling steadily over a number of months. This is due to a number of factors, including early intervention, improvement in drugs treatment, and better awareness of symptoms. Action taken by Health and Social Care includes the expansion of cardiac catheterization capacity and development of new primary percutaneous coronary intervention services, PCI, development of a community resuscitation strategy and the service, review of the service framework for cardiovascular health and well-being to set new priorities for cardiovascular health. Public information campaigns also highlight the health risks caused by smoking and obesity and in providing information on the signs and symptoms of conditions. Ian McRae. Mr. McRae. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Minister in the past has referred to inequalities within the health 
service. In relation to circulatory disease, can the Minister outline um, what the extent of inequalities that exist um, between particular groups across Northern Ireland? Um, well, the standardised death rate for circulatory disease in Northern Ireland as a whole reduced by more than two fifths between 1997-01 period and, and the 2006-10 period, so that's something very positive. And over the same period, the rate within the 20 most deprived areas saw a smaller reduction, reduced by one third, which meant that the mortality rates improved across all areas, but the inequality gap actually increased. So that's a big issue for us. The standardised hospital admission rate due to circulatory disease reduced by 5 per cent from 2000 to 2002 uh, compared to 2008 to 2010. And throughout this period, the inequality gap between the most deprived areas and Northern Ireland was uh, fairly steady and stood at 13 per cent. So clearly there is an inequality gap and that inequality gap um, continues to increase and that's a matter of regret. And it's an issue for us to continue to get the messages out there, uh, to develop the infrastructure that will support people in these areas. Uh, and we really need a change of lifestyle uh, for many people, which will make the fundamental difference uh, to outcomes uh, in health inequalities. Danny Kennehan, Mr. Kennehan. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answer um, so far. Um, children are more likely to receive an electronic gadget for a Christmas present rather than a bicycle. What's the Minister doing to reinforce to parents the importance of their children exercising and of parents leading by example? Well, in all of these things, uh, I think it's very important that um, we work across departments, uh, across departments and we have a cross-departmental working group and we discuss these issues as to how best we can get uh, messages through to the public, including children. And of course, schools are the best place to get messages um, through to children because they spend a lot of their time in schools. Uh, we have the sporting clubs, the Department of Culture, Arts and Leisure, um, are supportive of us in getting messages out through the sporting clubs. Uh, but very often, people who are engaged in sporting clubs are doing the right things in any event. So the schools are fundamentally important to us in getting the right health messages out. And public health, if it's initiated from the earlier points in life, will be a considerably uh, less of a challenge uh, as, we move to, uh, as people move into adulthood. And we have far too many young people who are clinically obese, and many of, for many of them it is avoidable. Um, so we need to be getting the messages out, uh, and particularly through education. Stephen Agnew. Mr Agnew. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Question number seven, please. I replied on the 8th of November to the member's priority written question, pointing out that I have not said that the courts have failed to act impartially in cases which I have been involved. I would also remind the member that there is not and never has been a, a ban on blood donations from gay men. Rather, it is a ban on men who have oral or anal sex with other men. And the restriction relates to behaviour as opposed to orientation. A number of other categories of individuals are also excluded from donating. The judge concluded that any change in Northern Ireland to the donor restriction on men having sex with men was not my responsibility. Mr. Agnew. Minister, on the 5th of November, you questioned, do I believe that I would get furnace in the Court of Appeal or would there be circling of the wagons? You have publicly raised a concern about the furnace of our appeal courts. Could you please outline in the past when you believe there has been a circling of the wagons or are you simply scapegoating the courts? Oh, oh, dear. I'm, I'm, I'm protecting the member plus the minister, and I'm being very careful that the member doesn't stay, stray into an area that could be seen as contempt of court. So I just would warn the member and the minister as well. Minister, could you outline any evidence you have to base, on which to base your concerns, or are you scapegoating the courts for your own errors? Uh, the, the member asked a question, and I suppose uh, if he thinks that there's some sort of deity exists in courts and there's a, a place of absolute perfection, uh, then I'd have to say that I'm not in a similar place. Uh, but I wouldn't be alone in that, because in this House, uh, in, in the committees of this House, His Honour Judge Marlon, with reference to um, the Appointments Committee in the courts, which is headed up by the most senior uh, people in the courts, actually said 
uh, of uh, an appointment. It was an illegal act, in my view. It was so irrational and so unfair that had I felt confident about going for judicial review and not fearful that I might end up bankrupt by doing so, I would have been very hopeful, given a fair wind, that a judge would have found the decision to be irrational and have the appearance of bias against me. I would have rather hoped that would be the decision. Unfortunately, I just did not have the confidence, given the factors that I have just mentioned, and the fact that a judge would then be put in the very difficult position of having to make such findings against the highest judicial figures in the land. I just did not feel confident that I would succeed, nor did my skilled QCs, which is David Schofield QC and Nick Hanna QC. Those aren't the words of Edwin Poots. Those are the words of his judge, or his honour, Judge Marlon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Lord Sumption, in a speech only two weeks ago, uh, made a, a, a number of comments about the judiciary and the attempts in which uh, judge-made law is now undermining the democratic process. And he said that he believes politics is a better way of resolving questions of social policy rather than judge-made law. Does the minister agree? Well, that's a matter that I've stressed to this House over and over again. And I just think it is super that some members in this House seem to think that it would be better if laws are made in courts as opposed to being made in a legislature and then enacted in courts. Because that is how the state was originally devised, that the parliament made the laws and the courts ensured that the laws were enacted properly. And uh, Lord Simpson did quite rightly point out uh, it is important to bear in mind that in a parliamentary democracy, the legislature can selectively enact into law whatever parts of the convention or the case law of the European Court of Human Rights it pleases. We do not need the Convention in order to introduce changes for what is a democratic mandate. The Convention and its judicial apparatus of enforcement are only necessary in order to impose changes where there is a democratic mandate. It is a constraint in the democratic process. I think that most people would recognise that there must be some constraints in the democratic process in the interest of protecting politically vulnerable minorities from oppression and entrenching a limited number of rights that the consensus of our society recognises is truly fundamental. Almost all written constitutions do this. But the moment that one moves beyond cases of real oppression and beyond the truly fundamental, one leaves the realm of consensus behind and enters the legitimate political debate where issues ought to be resolved politically. This House should be making these key decisions. Here, here. Mr. Kelly's not in his place. Brenda Hale. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question nine, please. I launched the Health and Social Care Board's Choose Well Public Awareness Campaign, which aims to help people gain a better understanding of the choices available and allow them to get access to the right services quickly. Because the number of genuine urgent and emergency cases rises during winter, hospitals, GPs, and community nursing teams all have their hands full. Choose Well is about helping the staff in our emergency services concentrate on the people who are the most sick and injured. It's about making it clear that the public, to the public that the emergency and 999 services are for life-threatening and serious conditions. Minor health care issues can be dealt with by checking advice online, at home, by a pharmacist or by a GP. I'd like to thank the Minister for his answer. And can the Minister inform the House what information is actually available within the emergency departments themselves about the appropriate use of these facilities? Well, there's a range of options which are used to raise awareness um, of appropriate uh, health services with patients in direct contact with our, our hospitals and in particular emergency departments. And patients can be advised on appropriateness of attendances at the triage uh, point. Um, and that will uh, avoid uh, inappropriate future attendances. Senior nurses can redirect patients to other facilities, uh, for example, GP out of ours, a local pharmacy, or indeed their own GP. Posters in main waiting areas can advise patients on the use of GP out of our services. And advice is also offered to non ED patients on what services are available to them locally. Patients can be advised by telephone of the use of appropriate services when queries are made regarding their condition. 
Order members, that includes order questions to the Minister of Health. We now move to topical questions. Question time. The, 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 <laughs> and we move on to topical questions to the Minister of Health. Question number one has been withdrawn. Judith Cochran. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Given the serious nature of the claims made against um, Cherry Tree Nursing Home and the RQIA, when does the Minister intend to bring forward a statement about the nature of the investigation to ensure that the public are aware of any actions that are being taken? Well, I'm very happy to bring that forward whenever RQIA have, have completed their, their course of work. Yes, um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the investigation um, into the actions um, against the regulator are actually being undertaken by other employees of the same body. Does the Minister think that an investigation by the RQIA into the RQIA is independent or objective? Yeah, uh, well. Uh, I could comment further on, 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 on that, that happening in other places, but I'll refrain. Uh, in terms of um, independence uh, regulation of health care, it certainly is a big issue. And I, I'm very happy for independent regulation of health care. I think that it's important that there is uh, a, a independent regulation. And we fund RQIA, uh, but RQIA are responsible for their own actions and activities. Uh, so we don't give them direction as to what to do. And I've been looking at other areas and look at, for example, the, the Care Quality Commission. Um, it's actually a non-departmental body of the United Kingdom government established in 2009. And whilst it describes itself as an independent regulator of all health and social care services in England, it is in fact accountable to the public through Parliament and the Secretary of State for Health. And again, much of its funding comes from the taxpayer. In Scotland, a public body was created in April uh, 2011, and it's part of the Scottish National Health Service, and its function is to implement the health care priorities of the Scottish Government, in particular the health care quality strategy of NHS. In Wales, there's an independent inspectorate and the regulator of all health care in Wales, but again, it carries out its functions on behalf of Welsh ministers. So, uh, I have to admit, it is a challenge to get a body which is wholly independent of government, because the truth is, who's going to pay for it? And you know, people will always be of the opinion, he who pays a paper calls the tune. I genuinely want independent regulation, because I think that it is good to keep um, everybody um, aware that, that that can be carried out and keep people on top of their game. But the most important aspect is that culturally, people should be wanting to do their best everywhere that they work for people that they care for, and culture is more important than regulation in that respect. Sandra Oberan. Mrs Oberan. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Um, could, could the Minister detail how his department measures safe staffing levels across our hospitals and detail any shortages there might be in Andrew Mary Hospital? Well, uh, certainly, in, in terms of staffing levels, uh, we, we have a, a means of identifying the numbers of staff that we should have in our facilities, and we seek to uphold them. Uh, we have different numbers of people in wards at different times, uh, and we have different challenges uh, in our hospitals. And on some occasions, um, those people who are on the ground will decide to pull people from one ward um, into another ward where there are particular pressures. Uh, and that is a natural course that, that happens. I should say that the feedback that I have been getting on Antrim Area Hospital um, over the course of the last number of months in particular has been so much more positive than was the case in the past. And uh, I think that we all need to recognise that and give some praise and, uh, to, to all of the people that are involved in delivering the service uh, that they are currently delivering. Uh, I think that the, the difference has been fundamental, and uh, in terms of, of normative staffing levels for nurses, uh, that is something that our uh, Chief Nursing Officer uh, has carried work out on, and uh, she is the person who is responsible for ensuring um, that we have the appropriate number of nurses uh, in our hospitals. 
thank you very much and I thank the Minister for that response. I understand that England is bringing in mandatory recording of safe staffing levels within their hospitals. From discussions with hospital staff members, this is needed here too, um, not only to ensure optimum performance by nurses, midwives, consultants and every other member of staff in the hospital, but for ideal patient care. Has the Minister any plans to do so here in Northern Ireland? Well, as indicated, the Chief Nursing Officer has carried out um, a course of work on normative staffing levels for, for um, nurses, and uh, I'm delighted to say that um, over the course of the last two and a half years, we have appointed many more nurses, in fact, um, around 500 more nurses. So that's good news for the people of Northern Ireland. I'm sure the member uh, will appreciate that and maybe wants to include it in a press release that goes out in the future. Jonathan Craig. Mr. Craig. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can the Minister outline the pressures that exist on the Ulster Hospital site in terms of having sufficient space to accommodate the services and departments that are required there? Well, the, the South Eastern Trust is in discussions with Knock Golf Club. Some people might be surprised to know regarding the acquisition of land currently leased to Knock Golf Club, adjacent to the location of the proposed emergency department and in the acute services block phase B and uh, that may be utilised if that land was acquired uh, to provide additional car parking. Uh, it also, we also facilitated an acquisition of Torbank School which is immediately adjacent to the hospital site. I visited the hospital site and indeed the Member of, of Parliament for Strangford uh, has had people in lobbying me in particular about the McDermott unit which is a cancer unit um, for people in the South Eastern Trust. <coughs> And uh, those facilities are not fit for purpose. Uh, and frankly, I don't, uh, I'm not satisfied that people who are receiving treatment for cancer care are being treated in substandard facilities. Uh, so that's a challenge for the South Eastern Trust to resolve. Uh, the case that they're currently making is that they do just, just don't have the space on the Ulster Hospital site uh, to accommodate uh, a new facility uh, for the McDermott unit. And what I've been saying to the Trust very clearly is that the South Eastern Trust provides service, services for the people across the South Eastern Trust area, and many of them will be at the main site, which is at the Ulster Hospital. There may be services which they would be better providing on some of the other sites that the Ulster Hospital have. So you've got the old Bangor Hospital, the old Ards Hospital, you've got the hospital in Downpatrick, and indeed you have the Lagan Valley Hospital. All of those sites offer options for further services to be carried out at those sites, enabling the key acute services uh, to be carried out at the main hospital, which is the Ulster Hospital, and ensure that the best possible facilities are available to people requiring those acute services. So I do think that the South Eastern Trust need to fundamentally look at what they're doing in terms of um, how they're using their estate and in making best use of their estate and I certainly think that there are other areas in their estate that they could do a lot more work on um, without impacting or damaging the service that is provided uh, to people in any way, shape or form in the South Eastern Trust. I would remind the Minister of the two-minute rule. Oh, sorry. Jonathan Craig. Thank you, Chair, and I thank the Minister for that extensive answer. Um, would the Minister agree with me? Obviously, as a lag and volley uh, MLA, I will... Uh, make the argument for Lagan Valley and acute or any services that could be transferred to that hospital. And would he also agree with me that there were plans in the past for services to be transferred to that hospital? Has the Minister any idea where those plans now lie? Well, the Lagan Valley site is, is a strong site and a strong contender and it, it, it remains um, a hospital with an emergency department and has many other um, key facilities still available at that site. So whilst the Ulster Hospital is the main acute hospital in the South Eastern <coughs> Trust, uh, certainly we recognise that the Lagan Valley uh, Hospital is carrying out an excellent service, and services can be expanded in that site. And in view of the pressures that are on Ul Ulster Hospital, almost certainly should be expanded at that site. I, I don't think that it's an acceptable uh, reason, or indeed an excuse, that people from who currently use the Ulster Hospital maybe wouldn't like to travel the distance to Lagan Valley because people who currently come from the Lisburn area are expected to travel the distance to the Ulster and as I can recall it's the same distance from Lisburn to Dundonald as it is from Dundonald to Lisburn. 
William Humphrey. Mr. Humphrey. I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Can I ask the Minister what actions has he taken in recent months on the issue of abortion and, in particular, lethal fetal uh, abnormalities? Again, this is one of these uh, vexed questions that comes before us um, where it's very difficult to, to get um, the perfect answer. Uh, but we are committed to publishing the, the guidance for health professionals in termination of pregnancy at the earliest opportunity, and although this is taking longer than I had hoped. Uh, the number and the complexity of the responses received means that it will take uh, some more time before a paper can be brought to the Executive. I am mindful that in previous versions of guidance since 2004 have been successfully challenged in the courts. And further legal advice requested through the Departmental Solicitor's Office has confirmed that the revised guidelines cannot change the options available to couples facing the very difficult and emotional circumstances of lethal fetal abnormality. Any changes around lethal fetal abnormalities would require amendments to the criminal law, which is a matter for the Department of Justice, and I have written to the Minister for Justice and executive colleagues on this matter. Work has continued on revising the guidance to take account of the responses to consultation and to reflect the existing law in a document summarising issues raised in the consultation is currently available on the Department's website. William Humphrey. Mr. Humphrey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answer. Can I ask the Minister uh, what meetings he has had with couples affected uh, with le lethal fetal abnormalities? I have met both the couples that um, come into the public domain and uh, who were advised that their baby had a lethal abnormality. And I also met with the clinicians who were providing advice to the couples. And uh, I'm writing directly to both the families that I met on this issue to provide them with an update on the situation. I've also received um, a vast amount of correspondence from others who have been in similar circumstances. Uh, many of them had made a decision to actually proceed um, with the pregnancy uh, because they felt that that's what they wished to do and had received real value from, from, from going ahead with the pregnancy. Uh, but I can understand fully that there are other people who are in different circumstance and uh, they don't feel that that uh, is the case for them. Uh, so we will try to deal as sensitively as possible with all of these issues. Uh, and I think that it is important uh, that sensitivity is applied on what are very, very personal and difficult and indeed heartbreaking decisions because I believe that all of these couples want to have the child in the first place. These are not people who are uh, wanting to engage in, in some uh, form of, of dispensing of a, of a pregnancy because uh, it was uh, something they hadn't planned. Uh, so we need to deal with all of these cases in a very, very sensitive way and give due consideration um, to everything that has been said to us. Ian Miller. Mr. Miller. Mr. Miller. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Could I ask the Minister uh, what, the, what impact has the new wing at Anthem Area Hospital have had on uh, waiting times in the NE? Well, I think that not just the, the new wing, but um, w there has been a change in the management team and the management structure there. And I think that together it has made a massive impact um, on the Antrim Area Hospital. Uh, at the end of September, there were 109,000 people waiting for outpatient appointments, um, which uh, was down by 21,000. But in terms of Antrim, um, 79 people waited longer than 12 hours in ED in September. And while 79 is too many, it has been the lowest number that there has been over the past four years. And I think we can see that Antrim Hospital isn't in the headlines. And that's a very positive thing because Antrim Hospital was in the headlines very often for all of the wrong reasons. Uh, I think that if it's, uh, the fact that it's not in the headlines is an indication uh, that the public are, are much more satisfied with the service that has been provided at that site. In um, minute. My week is done era good uh, done a very great good tea show. Uh, could I ask the Minister then, um, is there any other measures being brought forward to further decrease waiting times? Uh, any new thinking in those regards, uh, the figures that you have already stated? Gurmila, no good. Well, I think the measures that are being taken is that people are on the ground um, day and daily 
working very close uh, with, 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 the, with the people in Antrim, Hus uh, in Antrim Hospital. And I should clarify that 79 wasn't the, the number for Antrim, or the number, that was the number for Northern Ireland as an entirety. Um, Antrim was our worst hospital in terms of 12-hour breaches some time ago, and uh, that is no longer the case. Uh, so it has been performing remarkably well, and uh, I welcome the fact that people are actually on the ground, talking to the staff, uh, hearing what the problems are, uh, addressing those problems quickly, and as a consequence of that, the public are seeing um, a service which has improved vastly. And uh, we will continue to work with uh, the Northern Trust to ensure that uh, improvement continues uh, into the future. Order. Members, that includes questions to the Health Minister. Mr. Wells, I'll, I'll get you after question time. I know you're waiting patiently, but uh, <laughs> can we move to questions to 